Welcome to another lecture in the course Literature and Identity in the Middle East. I'm Dr. Nikoski and I'm the coordinator and teacher of this course. Today we will tackle the issue of language and identity. We will look into diversity in Palestinian society as also into the work of two authors, the poet Salman Masalha and the author Anton Shamas. The question of Palestinian identity, of who is a Palestinian, is not only a political question, and, then, and thus the answer depends on who is answering it. It, is also, it also depends on when, when one begins to tell the history, as always. As a historical geographical issue, since populations move constantly, and there is a natural migration from areas where economic conditions are less good to those where the conditions are better, when does the new population become the local population? In a modern nation state, this takes around five years. In more traditional systems, it might take much longer, decades or centuries. This is because the modern nation state is very is a very thin connective element of the group. It is easy to acquire this identity. Sometimes it is only a bureaucratic process. This thin identity has the advantage of allowing individuals to have many others' identities as well, according to their preferences in various aspects of life. It has the disadvantage, not originally apparent, but is quite apparent now, of not having a strong solidarity within the social group, within the society. Someone might feel more connected to another fortniter on the other side of the globe than to one's neighbor next door. This is quite a dire consequence which we see in the modern nation state. So these grand identities such as member of a nation state, member of the Ottoman Empire, member of the global village, which mind you existed also earlier in history, such as the, the Roman Empire, the larger the identity group is, the more vulnerable it is to uh, the lack of solidarity. Think of yourself as an Edomite, for example, being a member of the Roman Empire, and in light of this, you move to Rome, the center of the, the empire, the place where things happen. Will you be considered a Roman among Romans? Not necessarily, in spite of your feeling Roman in your hometown. Other Romans might not feel that you are like them. Think of uh, Christian identity. One of the innovations of Christianity which was highly promoted by the Apostle Paul, is that anyone can become a Christian, regardless of gender, race, ethnic group, or social status. But still, not only that all, not all Christians, uh, not, not all Christian-based societies feel so solidarity with each other, sometimes a church on one side of the street does not feel solidarity with a member of the church on the other side of the street. To return to Middle Eastern uh, issues, look at the notion of pan-Arabism, a very good idea that unfortunately does not really work. This is uh, nicely expressed in the story We Shall Return by uh, Muhammad Suleiman uh, in the anthology Gaza Writes Back, where one of the protagonists expresses his, his absolute assuredness that the great Arab nation, not the religion, but the Arabs will help the exiled Palestinian, while the two other uh, characters are quite doubtful about this idea. More traditional social systems with uh, smaller scale identities do not, do not merge their identities so easily into one big inclusive one. If a group migrates into another location, let's say a few uh, Romani families, move into the vicinity of Jerusalem, they would be identified as the Romanis for a very, very long time, until our days. 
even though for an outsider, they might look exactly uh, like the lo other local population. Surely for an outsider, but in many cases also for insiders. Here are some uh, pictures of, um, of Romani in the uh, vicinity of Jerusalem. One model, which I uh, heard from my, one of my uh, history teachers in the uh, past, of looking into this, the creation of a, a social system or you know, social grouping is the bus stop bench model. It, it goes like this. When you are alone waiting for the bus, you sit in the middle of the bench. If someone comes along to wait for the bus with you, you move a little, letting the other have an area of the bench too. If a third person arrives, you both make space for them as, as well, and so on. And the more people come, the more people have to uh, adjust themselves to accommodate others. I'm not saying that everyone is happy with the situation. Being happy is not a necessary state of life in traditional societies. But a certain level of accommodation is all that is necessary. Of course, if too, too many people are there, a conflict might arise or people might be standing. Yeah, being outsiders. Luckily, in this uh, sea mile, the bus comes and changes the whole situation. In real life, it, it takes much, uh, much longer until the bus comes or anything else that changes the whole situation. Diversity in a society can also be based uh, not on migration, but on ideology. So not on relocation of a social group, but in a new ideology. So when a new ideology is introduced, some groups adhere to it while others don't, or some individuals ad adhere to it and therefore become a group. This was the case with uh, the, the Protestant revolution in the areas of now the Netherlands, for example. Some sub areas remained Catholic and some ad adopted the new religion. This happened with Islam in the Middle East. Together with the political advent of the Arabs, the religion traveled as well and eventually was accepted by the local population and thus penetrated into areas that were Christian or Zoroastrian or, or other religions before that. This in turn creates othering within a society that was more coherent before. Yeah, so this is another form of creating othering. Othering is adhering to a new ideology. Thus we can see that the tension between identities in the traditional societies of uh, group affiliation is different from the tension in, modern, in the modern transformation of the idea of identity. In traditional societies, it is more interrelation between groups that live together and have to manage the living conditions uh, for their own group. While the new identity politics, which is more politics one, has to do with self-expression and is not looking into living conditions of the group, which is taken for granted as being okay to good in the modern society. But of course, uh, uh, self-evident good living conditions are not are not the case everywhere around the globe so let us move into palestinian society the palestinian nation the notion can be criticized as it is relatively a late phenomena that is palestinian uh, the palestinian nation people of the ottoman empire were citizens of the empire which spread from egypt to syria as far as um area we discuss our concern. To counter this criticism, I may say that nationalism is quite a new phenomenon for everyone. And even if the Palestinian nation emerged at a, as, as a result of the 48 war or the 67 war, this does not make it less uh, legitimate than other national identities. 
So as a, as a whole, the Palestinian, uh, Palestinian nation includes uh, both those who live in the area which is now the state of Israel, as well as um, those in, uh, in camps around and those in other countries around, as well as a, a large diasporic community of Palestinians. But for the sake of this uh, lecture, I will focus only on uh, those in the state of Israel. The population in Israel is um, 9,300,000 people, more or less. 73 to 74% are Jews, 21% uh, are Arabs, and there are, of course, others. The society which we designate as Palestinians is, uh, in fact, quite diverse. In modern Western categories, we like to talk about the distinction between Muslims and Christians when we talk about uh, Palestinian identity. But the grouping is, of course, more diverse than this. Here are some examples. I'm just uh, bringing some little examples uh, to show how more complex Palestinian society is. Uh, and I'm bringing some exotic uh, examples, if you want. So the, the Romani were one of them. I just talked about them. But here are um, the Druze. The Druze are a cultural and ethnic group of some uh, two and a half million people that live in Syria, Lebanon, Israel, and Jordan, and in the diaspora. They have their own dialect of Arabic. Syrian, Syrian type of uh, Arabic, but the origin of their religion is Egyptian from the Ismailia, which was influenced from Gnostic religion of the 10th, 11th century. They had to flee Egypt at some point, and this is how they arrived at southern Syria, uh, Lebanon, Galilee, which is now uh, uh, Lebanon and Galilee, and acquired their uh, the type of Arabic that they speak. It is a pure monotheistic religion in which the God is inconceivable. There were seven prophets in history next to which uh, there was always a sage of mysteries. In the time of Moses, this was, uh, this was um, Jethro, known from the Bible as Jethro, Shu'aib uh, in Arabic, who is known um, in the biblical narrative as the father-in-law of Moses. Their religion is secretive, or yeah, used to be secretive until um, academia got hold of it, known only to the Uka'il, and the rest of the population, population is named Juhal. Uh, children get access to the religion and decide at puberty whether they want to become Uka'il or, uh, Uka'il or, uh, or not. So there is an inherent religious elite in the system, if you think of, uh, uh, which is similar, if you think to the, to the Catholic system of monastic priesthood vis-a-vis -vis the rest of the believers. Uh, so there are some similar, similar, similarities there, uh, and both systems actually originated in the same religious atmosphere of late antique Middle East, uh, only, in, of course, in the in the in, in the Druze version, the religious elite are not um, monks; uh, they they have families. In the past one thousand years, one cannot convert into the Druze religion. This was a decision that was taken at some point, so they are constantly a minority. Wherever they are, they are a minority, and as a as a minority, they hold the best uh, survival strategy of complying with the regime, and this is their strategy. This is basically the case with uh, the Israeli state too. The Druze are Israeli citizens. They serve in the Israeli army. They have their own units, but they can serve in, in regular army units as well, uh, like combat, air force, uh, medical intelligence uh, units, etc. The problem is, of course, that the Druze, they are called Muwahidun, Druze is not their own self-designation. Uh, the Muwahidun from Israel, from the Israeli side of the border, and those from the Syrian side of the border, 
um, might have to, to, to fight against each other. And this is also against their culture to not to support their brothers. Uh, so, are the Jews Arabs or not? Are they Palestinians like the other Palestinians? This is, of course, a matter of choice. But the forces that work on it are the following. On the one hand, the Jews did not join other Arabs in the activities against the Jews before the establishment of the state uh, of Israel. And once the, the state was established, it took a lot of step, steps into winning the loyalty of the Jewish population. The Druze have a special status with regard to the, to the Israeli state. The religion is an official, officially recognized religion, one uh, religion in Israel. And the state even established um, new or renewed holidays. Uh, uh, Ziyarat al uh, Shu'ayb, the pilgrimage to, to, to, to the Prophet uh, Jethro, uh, when the tomb of the Prophet Shu'ayb is visited, this is um, sort of uh, something that was supported and promoted by the State of Israel. The Druze are subject to obligatory draft into the army, which in Israel results in having higher social status later in life, being acceptable into official positions uh, and, and more other benefits. Uh, there is much state-ic, state-type discourse about the wonderful relationship between the Druze and the State of Israel. Many Druze agree with this and many Druze leaders take part in this. על מנת תיכנס לחוג של הדת, אתה צריך ללמוד דברים בתורת הנסתר, ולכן זה קשה. ולכן אחוז הדתיים הוא 15 אחוז, ולא כולם אפילו מבינים את הדת. צמל הדתי מורכב מחמישה צבעים, ירוק, אדום, צהוב, כחול ולבן. הירוק זה טבע, אדום זה אהבה, צהוב חיטה, כחול מים, ולבן זה טוהר. בישראל יש 120 אלף הדרוזים, כולל רמת הגולן. הקדושה היא למקום שבו נולדת. אין קדושה לגבולות. חלק מנביאי העדה הדרוזית קבורים במדינות אשר אין לישראל יחסים דיפלומטיים עימן, כגון סוריה ולבנון. אולם, מדינת ישראל פותחת את גבולה ומאפשרת מעבר של חכמי העדה הדרוזית כחלק מחופש הפולחן הדתי והבנת צורכי העדה הייחודיים. יש חופש פולחן מלא, אין שום הפרעה, להפך מעודדים, ואפילו נתנו ימי חופש לדרוזים בעלייה לקבר נבי שועי, בעלייה לקבר נבי סבלן, ולכן חופש הפולחן הוא מוחלט ואין עליו עוררין. But not everyone sees things in his way. And people of the Druze society now, nowadays, as opposed to, let's say, 30 years ago, prefer to identify themselves as Arabs, as Palestinians, as, and to avoid uh, the obligatory draft. There's a movement against the bear hug of the state among the Druze uh, now, which is called Furud, and yeah, to, to separate. Another group, is, uh, another group is the Bedouins. The Bedouins overall are still a semi-nomadic group stretching from the Arabian Peninsula all the way to Egypt and the Galilee. They are 3.5% um, of Israeli population, most of them living in the ne Negev, but there are uh, many, be many Bedouin towns and villages in the Galilee as well. Since the establishment of the State of Israel, there was a process of uh, forcing or convincing the Bedouins to settle. This is, of course, a radical change from their way of life. They traditionally manage themselves in social groups of tribes, of tribal affiliation, in relation to a large uh, area of land. And this area is larger than acceptable 
in a modern nation state. They, they therefore restrict the development opportunities of the nation state, and this is something that the state does not accept. The Israeli state prefers, of course, for the population not to be nomadic, and they built uh, some settlements for them, like the famous city Rahat, as well as um, the town Shibli, uh, which you can see here uh, at the background. The state also destroys spontaneous settlements, as they are called, because in a modern bureaucratic state, one has to get a right, uh, the right uh, cert certification before building a house. In a more traditional system, uh, the frame of, of mind. In a more traditional system, the frame of mind is that uh, if this is your area of land, you can do there. Uh, whatever, not whatever you want, but ac according to the rules that you have established already, but certainly not a thing to, to get all these bureaucratic certificates. But in the, nations, in the nation state, uh, these are illegal uh, buildings, illegal, illegal uh, settlements. And uh, these uh, suffer also from, and so, and the state does not support it, so they suffer from a lack of infrastructure and sometimes destroyed and then actually leaving a, uh, leaving a population without their living conditions. The Bedouin population is relatively poor and disconnected from the society more than other groups. Uh, in the, the, the state is trying to solve the situation, not, not giving it enough effort, but there are a lot of um, efforts which are less official that are trying to do it. The Ben-Gurion University, for example, which is in the Negev, they have developed special programs to encourage education among both men, Bedouin men and women. And you find uh, in the university staff and in the I don't know, doctors and, and, and lawyers that are uh, Bedouins. Uh, the issue of polygamy, of course, is prominent among the Bedouins and is problematic, as you can see here. There are only two reasons a woman would agree to her husband marrying a second woman. Either she doesn't love him or she wants to get rid of him because he's driving her crazy. There's no woman who wants to see her husband with another woman. Juliet is one of many women in Rahat who've experienced polygamy. It's difficult to know exactly how widespread the practice of polygamy really is, because not all marriages are reported to the authorities. But the latest government figures state that at least 20% of Bedouin families are polygamous. Though the practice is illegal in Israel, the government mostly turns a blind eye. One member of parliament, Taleb Abu Arar, is even openly married to two women. Still, the tides are beginning to shift, thanks in part to activists like Insaf Abu Shareb, one of the Bedouin community's first female attorneys. The Israeli government's decision in January 2017 to deal with the phenomenon of polygamy was thanks to my efforts. It's only in the past year or so that people have been indicted on charges of polygamy. Fifteen indictments have been filed, something which never happened before. The Quran lays out conditions for polygamy. For instance, when there is a war and many men are killed, lots of orphans are left. In this context, where there are fewer men, a man is allowed to take a second wife. Unfortunately, and in my view, the majority of men who today have several wives in truth set a very negative example. The man sometimes becomes a victim of this practice. If not him, then his first wife. If not her, then the second wife. If not her, then the children suffer from his decision. Sometimes, Bedouin women choose to enter polygamous relations for personal reasons. Like Ehlam, who saw it as a way for her to become independent and pursue a career. I am a second wife. In the beginning, my family was very much against the idea of getting married to someone who already had a wife. It was my choice, 
I feel as though I'm different from others in the community because I live in peace. You can't tell the difference between my kids and the first wife's kids. We eat together, we go out together, she lives next door and comes over freely. We live a normal life. We divide things this way. One day he's here, the next day he's with the other wife. If today he's here with me, he eats dinner, sleeps, goes to work the next morning, and comes back to his second family. But he still sees all the children. Despite her positive experience, Ahlam says she still wouldn't want her daughters to follow in her footsteps. That's because women in polygamous marriages suffer from high rates of domestic violence, depression, and sexual assault. For these reasons, many argue it's time for the Israeli government to put a stop to the practice once and for all. My biggest criticism is towards the government because although the government comes and says we're against it and although we're in a democratic country and it's actually illegal, they still haven't found a way to really, really have a kind of zero tolerance towards it. A third group, which is even more exotic than uh, the first two, are the Circassians. I'm only talking about them because they're so exotic. Circassians is a minority group of around 5 million people living in the diaspora. Circassian is a general external name. They call themselves uh, Adigi, Adigi in, in Russian. They are a diverse group of, the, the, the group is divided into 12 tribes, originally coming from the northern Caucasus and they were displaced in the 19th century during the Russian Caucasus War in 1864. They were given the choice between leaving for Turkey or being resettled in another place. Some chose uh, one, others chose uh, the other option. They were a culture in the original Caucasus area since 4000 BC, so they are a very ancient uh, group. They became Christians in the 5th century until the, the, eighth, uh, the, uh, the 10th century. Before that, they were influenced by uh, Greek religion. When Islam came, they became Muslims, Sunnis, since the, the, the 16th century, more or less. Uh, they adhere to the, beside the religion, you know, next to the religion, as, as, as you say, they adhere to the Adiji Khabze, the, uh, the honor law, the law of honor, which talks about courage, uh, courage, generosity, loyalty, and self-control. So for them, chasing money or chasing show-offness is shameful. So that's the group. In Israel, there are around 4,000 of them in two villages in the Galilee. Uh, Kafar Kamma is one of them, and Rehania is another. There are more than 900 Circassian villages around in Turkey. Uzun Tarla in Kocaeli is just one of them. Let's see what kind of traditions are still alive and look into the daily lives of local residents. Haluj, as they say in Circassian, is one of the essential savory pastries made for most celebrations. Haluj is commonly made for religious holidays, weddings and wedding preparations. Bizim annelerimizden, anneannelerimizden çok eski bir geleneğimiz. Her bayramda yapılan bir kurban bayramı, şeker bayramı fark etmiyor. Hepsinde bunu yapıyoruz. Here are some parts of the film made about them. One of the important resources of the village is Circassian cheese. There are two different kinds of Circassian cheese, fresh and smoked. Çerkes peynirinin hiçbir katkı maddesi yok. Tamamen kendi suyu. Kendi suyunu ekşitiyorum şeyde, böyle bidonlarda. Onları kullanıyorum yani. Normal peynirden farkı, normal beyaz beyaz peynirleri, onlar peynir mayasından mayalıyorlar. Bunu hiçbir yabancı madde hiçbir şey girmiyor. Tuzlu her kademeye her kademeye tuz döküyorum. Şeyi alacak mesela böyle. 
He puts 44 kilos of milk in one large pot, which produces four wheels of cheese. Ee, Anadolu'da Kayseri'de Kahramanmaraş'ta böyle şey yapmıyor, istemiyorlar. Bu şekilde yani oralarda rutubet olmadığı için bu şekilde güneşe koyuyorlar. Güneşte şey yapıyorlar, güneşte kurutuyorlar yani çerkez peynirini. Şimdi iki gün ocakta falan kalıyor. Ondan sonra dolapta da kaldıktan sonra böyle yine şey gibi oluyor yani kuru gibi olmuyor tabii. Eski çerkez peynirleri gibi şey olmuyor yani. Onlar e, ocaklarda 20 gün bir ay duruyordu. Buzdolabı olmadığı için sonra onları e, öyle saklama imkanlar oluyordu yani. Bozulmasın diye bunlar taş gibi oluyor. Onları bıçaktan bıçaktan zor keserdik. Böyle bıçaktan zor kesin kesilmez. Zor keserdik. İşte çerkez pastası yapıldı, yapıldığı zaman onun içine koyardık bazı şeyleri. İşte orada yumuşardı bu sefer. Sıcağı gördüğü zaman yumuşardı yani. So this film was in uh, the Circassian language and about Turkey but just to uh, show you that the um, Circassians live in Israel as well. Here is a short film that, or a clip of a film that was made by a um, Circassian person, person explaining to the Israelis about the Circassian people in Hebrew because he uh, lives in Israel. Video ki bu akatuna Circassi, kelelu tamid rikudei am Circassi. Ve rikudei am Circassi ma ele em khelek mahuti ve terbut beze she Çerkesi ki o şu lomet bir daber Çerkesi ki o şu noşen Çerkesi haya baya da dağıt lirkot Çerkesi ve lomet gam ayom lirkot Çerkesi. Anakın o yom, ağamı Çerkesi o yom ulo be Kavkaz. O bir fuzar ki mar da... Here's a short clip from an item from Al Jazeera about the Circassians. The ones from Jordan in this case. This is just the beginning. And the man, man there tells uh, the, the, the history of their life in Jordan and how they arrived there in the 19th century. And he talks about identity. قصة عائلة برمامت عائلتي زي قصة كل عائلة الشركس اللي اجوا على الأردن بعد حرب 200 سنة مع الروس والمؤامرة اللي صارت بين قيصر روسا وسلطان تركيا والهجرة القصرية الجماعية لثلاث ملايين شركسي شيشاني داغستاني طلعوا من بلادهم واجوا على أهل البلاد اجوا على الإمبراطورية العثمانية طبعا والعثمانيين وطنوا الشراكس في الأماكن الضعيفة عندهم في يوغوسلافيا وسوريا والأردن و... فكان نحن نصيب عائلتنا أنه اجينا هون على الأردن ماشي من القفقاس للأردن ف... وعائلتنا اجوا شوية متأخرين بحدود 1885 فكانت الأراضي توزعت اللي كانوا العثمانيين بدهم وزعوها على الشراكس فهنا الشراكس بتقنوش إشي غير إما يكونوا عسكر حربجية أو مزارعين فلاحين فلما إجوا على قرية عمان وكانت قرية بيولي شركسية استوطنوا بيتنا كان اللي هلا معروف بعصفور كوسط البلد هذا كان آخر بيت في عمان اللي ولد فيه أبوي بعدين رحلوا لكازية وفا الدجاني بشارع وادي سير أو الأمير محمد الناس قالوا لهم يا مجنين وين رحتوا بالخلا It was out of town ولدرجة أنه أبوي شاف ضبع بيأكل فخدة راعي قدام بيتهم ف... والشارع بال... بالشتاء يكون نهر جارتنا وقعت في النهر وغرقت ونط... وعم أبوي نط في النهر وأنقذها لهالدرجة كان الوضع بسيط وكقرية حتى طبعا عمان تحولت لعاصمة والناس إجت وتوسعت فالشركس تحول الانفايرومنت أو البيئة تبعتهم من بيئة شركسية خالصة لا ضاعوا في المدينة الكبيرة 
فهي المشكلة الكبيرة للمجتمع الشرقي عندنا في الأردن قضية الهوية نحن مين وين رايحين وشو مستقبلنا They are an exotic group in the Middle East, uh, in the Middle Eastern context, but they're a bit more typical, I may say, in a Caucasian context. Yeah, but they are a totally displaced group uh, living outside their original area for already uh, 200 years or so. They're completely Muslim in their religion, but not in their political affiliation or in their national one. Nationally, they, are affili they affiliate themselves with wherever they are. Being an, a DG, you know, being uh, Circassians, is also a dominant part of their identity always. So, but what can we call this? Is this ethnic? Is it cultural? Is it historical? What, what type of identity being in a DG is? The, uh, the concern the men in the film expresses is uh, quite real, since it is difficult to keep the culture of such a small group as uh, different from the hegemonic culture, the Jordanian in this case, and the difficulty does not arise because of political tension or even because of a religious tension. It is difficult situation of a minority culture of something that we just saw that it's hard to say what it is exactly. So, Palestinian society is diverse. Uh, the tensions are between uh, the inner diversity and the outer forces put on them, whether from the international community, yeah, so the, the world wants them to be the, the Palestinians. Uh, on the other hand, the state of Israel wants them to be diverse, so they don't join together against the state. Uh, these are the forces. Let us now move to look uh, into the issue of literature and identity. We have seen some other examples, but for most Palestinians, Arabic is the first language. Uh, but Hebrew is the second language. Yeah, except in some cases that we've seen here. Hebrew is the official language of the country uh, and it is obligatory part of the education higher education beyond high school, that is universities or higher professional education, is mostly conducted in Hebrew. So whoever wants to get higher education must be able to participate in learning in Hebrew. The percentage of Arab students in the BA studies in Israel overall is some 20% yeah, in the Hebrew speaking uh, universities. Writing literature in Hebrew, on the other hand, is not required for, for a Palestinian. There's an audience for Arabic literature. So writing in Hebrew has an added level to simply being a, an author, a writer. It is a way of bringing oneself to be involved with the hegemonic voice. Even though as a Palestinian, one is not the hegemonic voice. So being involved does not mean to agree with, but it means to interact. This may happen uh, because of a few reasons. First of all, because one wants to reach a point of success in a society as a whole, not only in one's sector uh, of the society. Think of uh, Kader Abdullah, for example, the Dutch author. Ha had he written in Persian, his career would have uh, looked completely different. There's the aspect of insisting that also as a minority, one is part of the society. So my voice as a minority should be heard. This is, this is, this is a political statement, if you want. Uh, and in a way, always part of uh, Palestinian literature when written in Hebrew. This is part of being a minority, yeah? that when you express yourself in the hegemonic voice, this is also a political statement. But one added aspect has to do with writing in general, with the universality of being an author, with its universal quality. Writing in your second language, one that you know quite well, but not your mother tongue, gives, gives the author a kind of freedom, 
freedom from uh, familiar patterns, freedom to explore without feeling being obliged to work in a particular way. This is perhaps not something that uh, we could have thought of uh, from the outside of being an author, but it is something authors uh, report about, including those that we are going to look at uh, now. So let, let us look now into uh, two Palestinian authors who write or wrote in Hebrew, the poet Salman Masalha and the author Anton Shamas. Salman Masalha was born in 1953 in an Arab town of Mgar. It is a Druze city, but he relates to it as an Arab city. He, yeah, that's how he presents it. Uh, it is in the Galilee and he lived in Jerusalem since 1972. He studied at the Hebrew University and holds a PhD degree in uh, classical Arabic literature. His dissertation was about the mytho mythological aspects of early Arabic poetry. He writes poems in Hebrew and in Arabic and he translates between uh, the two languages. Occasionally he writes articles to the Haaretz uh, newspaper, a very famous one. For his book In Place, he was awarded the President's Prize for Hebrew Poetry. He is critical of both Jews and Arabs. Jews for um, the empty inclusive discourse that they have. So they have a discourse of in inclusivity, but they don't back it up. They don't really include and the Arabs for a sentimental and non-realistic nostalgia and about clinging to traditionalism, for example, in their attitudes toward uh, women. Here is uh, him reading a poem in, the, in an evening that was dedicated to both um, uh, to him and some, uh, some other, um, one other um, Israeli author, a woman, שיר בית. בית ראשון. בית אבא, בית ערבי, בית טוב. בית יראה, בית שמש, בית בת. בית זרע, בית לחם, בית אילן. בית שני. בית ספר, בית נתיבות, בית מדרש. שיעורי בית, בית יין, בית מרזח, בית משפט. בית סוהר, בית אולפן, בית שלישי, בית דירות, בית משותף, שלום בית, בית תמחוי, בית חולים, בית עלמין, בית עולם, בית נבחרים, בית מצורעים, בית צ'כי, בית הנשיא, בית קלון, בית בושת, בית העם, בית אישי, בית חזה, בית מנוס, בית מסוס, בית אוצר, בית אבל, בית שיר, בית מקדש, בית עש. And here he's, uh, here he's reading something in Arabic. אעתרפת. <laughs> أنا زرعت الداء في الجسد أنا قطفت الثمرة أنا حفرت الآن في الأبد وكتبت النظرة أنا شققت القلب في السهد فوجدت الفكرة أنا عددت قبل موت العشرة أنا حرقت الماء بالهموم أنا جرحت الأفق أنا عصرت الخمر في النجوم وشربت الألاقة أنا رسمت الزهر في الكلوم وفتحت الطرق أنا قلعت من طريق الشجرة أنا 
زرعت الداء في الجسد أنا قطفت الثمر أنا حفرت الألف الأبد وكتبت النظر أنا شققت القلب في السهد فوجدت الفكرة أنا عدت قبل موت العشرة أنا حرقت الماء بالهموم أنا جرحت الأفق أنا عصرت الخمر في النجوم وشربت الألق أنا رسمت الزهر في الكلوم وفتحت الطرق أنا خلعت من طريق الشجرة أنا وحيد في الندم أنا بريد للعدم أنا لسان لم ينم كونوا قضاة بررا وعفوا عن الألم And here is his poem which is uh, was written in Hebrew and is called I write in Hebrew. I write Hebrew. I write in the Hebrew language, which is not my mother tongue, to lose myself in the world. He who doesn't get lost, will never find the whole. Because everyone has the same toes. Left big toe by right heel. And sometimes I write Hebrew to cool the blood that spurts endlessly from my heart. It's always like that. There are many treasures in the coffer I have built in my chest. But the colors of the night that was spread over exposed walls, peel without ever knowing what all of this wonder is. And I write Hebrew, to get lost in my words, and also to find a bit of interest for my footsteps. I have not stopped walking. Many paths have I traveled. Engraved by my hands. I shall take my feet in hand and meet many people. And make them all my friends. Who is foreign? Who far? Who near? There is no strangeness in the ways of the world, because strangeness, mostly, lies in man's heart. This poem is in fact very uh, rich poetry and is full of allusions, some of which are meaningless uh, or are lost in the English translation and would also make less, less sense in Arabic. So it is indeed pure Hebrew poetry. The poetic voice here tells about writing in a language it is not his mother tongue, not the mother tongue, and the drive to do so, and the consequences of writing in, uh, in, in this language. Writing in Hebrew, he says, is to lose oneself in the world. This means here to get out of the immediate motherly surrounding in order in order to be a small, unseen, insignificant part of the larger environment. The tension, and as well as the pain here, is exactly in this. In order to be part of the world, the poet's voice here has to give up his home identity. This is, of course, true for anyone uh, who is not part of the hegemony, but so much more so for, Palesti for Palestinians. In, uh, the, in the Palestinian case, the hegemony is in ma many aspects, at least uh, as they see it, erasing their existence, not to say their identity. Masalha is quite insistent in this poem to take part in the world, as he calls it. But the discourse of blood that issues from his heart, the loss of words, and the naive invocation of finding the whole, everyone has the same toes, and making everyone his friends, this ends up with the assertion that strangeness is there always because it is in the heart. The strangeness and the loneliness, I would say, is also a result of uh, aspects of Arabic society of which, of which Masalha is critical. The nostalgia I mentioned above, we can see, we can see it here, and I'm quoting uh, uh, a few lines from another poem, which is called Water, and translated by uh, Vivian Eden. The river is a lost land. It won't return to the mountain tops without passing through the sea's womb. It won't avail the river to search the cracks of the earth for its orphaned family. So the river cannot go back to where it came from. And so cannot Palestinian life. The idea of return to a situation in the past 
which is the essence of nostalgia, is, non, is not realistic. It will not avail the river to search the cracks, the place where the river used to be. The flowing of time makes everything, the flowing of time changes everything, and the river has to be re reborn if it wants to live again. About his, uh, about uh, Masalha's uh, bilingual writing, so to um, young scholar El Dekel and Eran uh, Selgov, writing an article titled The Hope of Salman Masalha, Re-Territorializing Hebrew. Salman Masalha, this is what they write, a bilingual author publishing in both Arabic and Hebrew, challenges the interrelation between territory, language, and identity, which according to them exists in uh, Israeli culture. In the context of Deleuze and Gattari's theory of uh, minor literature, it was assumed that Hebrew works, if written by Arabs, is deterritorializing the Hebrew language, detaching it from its natural users. But, but they, on the other hand, these uh, scholars, uh, claim that Masalha's Hebrew poetry is in fact re-territorializing the Hebrew language. That is, it turns Hebrew from a language of the Jewish people to the language of the region, to the language of someone from here, as the Hebrew title of the book uh, is. This is how these two scholars, Dekel and uh, Tselgov, analyze uh, Masalha's poetry, a very similar thing was said by Anton Shamas, the author, about himself, and we will look at his work now. Anton Shamas was born in 1950 to a Palestinian father and a Lebanese mother, and he was raised uh, Christian. He first grew up in Fasulta, an Arab uh, area in Israel, um, by the south of the Lebanese border with a large Palestinian Christian uh, population. The family, would, uh, the family moved to Haifa in 1962, and uh, Shamas later moved to Jerusalem where he finished his studies in English literature, art history, and Arabic literature. In 1987, he moved to the US and became a professor of comparative literature and near uh, uh, and Middle Eastern studies at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. Being fluent in Arabic and Hebrew, Shamas translated uh, works from Arabic into Hebrew, among which was the novel, The Secret Life of Said, the Pes Optimist by Emil Habibi, which originally was written in Arabic. Shamas has written a few poetry collections in the 70s, but most famous and popular work is his novel Arabesques from 1986. All these were written in Hebrew. He has, uh, he has some poetry and uh, smaller works in English and in Arabic, such as uh, Arabic collection of poems called Imprisoned in My Own Awakening and Sleep. Arabesques, on the other hand, was never translated into Arabic. For a summary of Arabesques, I'm following, and also to some of the analysis of it, I'm following a few scholars. Uh, they are Shai Ginsburg, uh, David Hadar, uh, their articles, as well as Greenberg and Ashkenazi's uh, article about the novel. So Arabesques is a family history of the narrator who identifies himself as Anton Shamas. From the family's immigration from Syria in the first half of the, of the 19th, uh, 19th century and its settlement in the village, villages of Fasuta in the Galilee through the Arab uprising of 36-39 and the establishment of the State of Israel in 48 until the present. This section of the, uh, of the book, or this part of the plot, is titled The Tale. Into this family history, the narrator weaves what seems to be a metapoetical 
commentary, yeah? so reflective about the writing on the process of uh, narrating his history, mainly in the form of a diary. And it tells about the teller's life, yeah? the, the, the author's life, the life of the author who wrote the, the, the other part of the book, uh, life in Israel, in the West Bank, in Paris, and ends up in Iowa. I mean, all these places. Uh, he lived in Israel and visited the other places. And the last place is Iowa. The present present of the plot is in Iowa in the U United States, where he attended an international writers program in which Shamas indeed participated in the mid-80s. This section, yeah, the reflective part of the plot is titled constantly The Teller. So there's the tale and there is the teller. The two sections are intertwined and both mix truth and fantasy. Yeah, so it's, they're not smooth. Shamas writes a very complex book, very arabesque indeed, as its name suggests, partially fictional, partially seemingly biographical. So such a combination is accepted as traditional in Arabic literature of fantasy and reality and is very likable by the audience. It's, it creates a, a multi-level uh, multi narrative where one gets both the story as well as the, the, the stream of consciousness, so to speak, of the author. And it has a strong emotional impact on the reader, this combination. Shamas work is is is quite unique at the, in, in the level that he at the level to which he brings this type of writing through uh, yeah this is now part of the story through a conversation with a Palestinian woman uh, Anton Shamas of the of the story discovers that his older cousin after whom he is named and whom everyone thought was dead might actually have survived and has been adopted by a Lebanese family. So from this point on in the story, we have two Anton Shamas. Shamas then travels to Iowa City for, for this um, uh, via Paris and uh, to this uh, program. And on the way or there also, he meets an Israeli writer who tells him that he plans to write a book based uh, on the encounter with Shamas. The Shamas character presumably writes this novel that we are now reading. And it, but his Hebrew typewriter is being stolen. He also meets there a man who may be his uh, long lost namesake cousin, only he has another name. This cousin gives him a manuscript that might be, might be the novel that we are actually reading, or part of it. So we see here how the plot curls into itself, to the extent that we don't know who wrote the story, as it could be one of a few people. Yeah, the the external, the internal, the cousin. The, the, the external Shamas, the internal Shamas, the, the cousin Shamas, who is not called Shamas. And also the characters curl into themselves. Both, uh, bo both possible authors are called Anton Shamas. The complexity of the novel suggests to us who are studying identity and literature, uh, a few observations and here I'm also following uh, some of the others and uh, a few observations <clears throat> regarding the language. Uh, yeah, you can think of the stolen Hebrew typewriter. Uh, regarding the language and the circumstances of a Palestinian writing in Hebrew, the novel resists normal interpretation regarding identity. We hardly know who the protagonist is since there are two, uh, two of them. We cannot tell what the plot is as it curls on, onto itself. And this novel has been written in a period where literary theory blurs the borders between reality and text, between truth and fiction, between author and reader. And this novel is innovating, innovative and unique. 
a sort of category for itself in accommodating all these blurs. Now, with regard to, to writing in Hebrew, uh, here is something that Shamas himself uh, wrote in his essay, which is called Your Worst Nightmare. What I'm trying to do, mollishly, stubbornly, it seems, is to undo the Hebrew language, to make Israeli, to make it Israeli and less Jewish, thus bringing it back to its Semitic origins and to its place. This is what I think uh, the state should be, the state of Israel should be, as English is the language of those who speak it, so Hebrew should be the language of those who speak it. So the state should be the state of all those who live in it and, uh, yeah, and all those who speak the language and not to play with its destiny by uh, remote control. Yeah, he's referring to Jews outside of Israel. So here is a very political agenda. When he writes in Hebrew, there, in writing in Hebrew, we find his political agenda, political not in the sense of being prime minister, but in a sense of um, making a statement for, uh, for, the, for the whole society. A political agenda, if you want, which might at first sight look reversed. Instead of the Palestinian rejecting the Hebrew, and seeming, seemingly also Jewish hegemony, they join in it as a form of resistance. A third issue, and here this also regard, is regarding identity, is the interaction of the Shamas, Shamas protagonist with the Jewish Israeli author in, in the story. He is called Yosh Baron. They meet in Iowa as both are invited to take part in this uh, writing uh, pro program. And here we find the most uh, cynical, actually, and critical aspect of the novel in terms of identity and the Israeli-Palestinian relationship. So this is what Baron, Yosh Baron is telling the Shamas character in the book. This is page 137. I am writing a new novel, with an educated Arab as its hero, he told me. I don't think I'll ever have this kind of opportunity again, to be under the same roof with a person like that in ideal conditions of isolation. I regarded him with astonishment and said, we have one little problem. I don't think of myself as what you people call an educated Arab, I'm just another intellectual, as you call your educated Jews. He immediately began to apologize that he hadn't expressed himself properly. All I want is to get to know you from up close he said, while at the same time preserving a certain amount of aesthetic distance between us, for a sake of objectivity, you know. I shall try my best not to disappoint you. Let's do some text world analysis on this paragraph. I put the two texts that uh, um, Yosh Baron is saying is on the left, and the answer, the answer of Anton Shamas is here on the right. Uh, this is the text that you've just uh, heard. So let's start. Word building elements. Of course, the time is the, the, the writing program. That's uh, where it's happening. The enactors are Baron and Shamas. And the first thing that is happening is that the Baron is making a world switch, a Bulumaic world switch. Baron is making a Bulumaic world switch into world switch one, where he's saying that he's writing a novel. Actually, he's, he wants to write a novel. He's saying that he's writing a novel with an Arab as a protagonist. And from there, he's making a Bulumaic world switch into world switch two, where he's saying that he's happy to be with an educated Arab under one roof. And this implies an epistemic world switch within the mind of Baron. Yeah? So this is completely uh, an actor accessible only. And this implies the knowledge that Shamas is an educated Arab. That this is what is uh, going on here. 
And as a reaction to this, Shamas is making the following negative epistemic uh, world switch into yeah so you can follow the top blue line there into world switch four where he is saying that he is not an educated arab so he's negating the complete knowledge yeah that the the that the uh, that the jewish author has in his mind and he's making a new epistemic uh, modal world where he's saying he's just an intellectual and he's actually saying i'm just an intellectual as an educated jew is he's identifying himself with the jewish author and by this actually undermining the whole possibility to write a novel with an Arab, an educated Arab, because there is no educated Arab. There is an educated person, which is something um, um, disconnected from ethnic identity. And this is what is being said here in the end. So of course we could uh, analyze some more parts, but I just wanted to have this one because it really um, pinpoints the problem. The, yeah, the, the fact that trying to be nice and, and talking about an educated Arab is already defying the point because it's being um, patronizing towards Arabs because they're not educated Arabs, they're just educated people. The person who is crystallized in the image of this uh, Josh Baron is actually very easy to identify. It is the author, A.B. Yehoshua, who some of you know because they worked on the story in the story group. Yeah, the story Facing the Forest is the one written by, by this Josh Baron or uh, A.B. Uh, Yehoshua. So Shamas resists this Jewish author relating to, to him as an educated Arab, a, resistant, a resistance that once we are aware of it is indeed makes us recognize how pa patronizing this is. Uh, you are not an educated person, you are an Arab. And as such, we can talk about you as educated or not. In the story, um, the Jewish author apologizes, but it still does not change his attitude. He's, he does not even recognize that this does not change his attitude. Uh, in spite of himself, he eventually tells Shamas of the story that uh, he doesn't have to worry anymore. He found another Arab to be the model for his novel. And that Arab is good because uh, he's ready to get into an intellectual conflict with Baron, which uh, Shamas is not ready to do. So it is clear what Shamas is saying here. You, the hegemony, you do not look at minority as you look at people from your own group. People from a minority group are always, first and foremost, from a minority group. And this attitude feels like othering. Indeed, Aleph Bet Yoshua wrote a book in which one of the heroes was an Arab, not an intellectual. Uh, actually, it is a teenage boy who has a, a love affair with the wife of his boss. This book was very successful and the Arab protagonist was one of its uh, strongest aspects, uh, if not uh, the strongest. Does the target of Shamas resistance or blame or critique is in fact an author who, first of all, identifies himself as an Arab? The family of, of A.B. Yehoshua uh, on his father's side is sixth generation in the country, probably similarly or longer than the family of Shamas. And some parts of Yehoshua's family is from Morocco, which uh, in Israel they um, tend to think of as, as, as Arabs. Furthermore, Yehoshua is one of the, uh, on, on the left side of the political map and uh, 
resents the situation in the territories occupied in the Six Day War uh, and is shouting everywhere about it and the terrible conditions in which Palestinians live. Uh, if you know the story facing the forests, uh, he talks there about the destroyed Palestinian villages, which were uh, covered by uh, forestation as a way to hide them and uh, by the regime. And at the time, this was a very daring statement to make in literature, since no one talked about it. It was a taboo. So uh, what is going on here? So here is the thing. This, uh, this is thing is, is not so... Uh, optimistic. Apparently, when one is hegemony, one cannot see properly the point of view of the non-hegemonic people. Point. They would always be at fault, always not doing something right, because the right is the hegemony, and it is not spelled out, but implied. Yeah. So, what is right is implied. So you cannot even know how to do what is right. Sometimes there's yeah, there's no um, no way out of it if you are a, a minority. But also, apparently, there is no escape from the situation of a hegemony and a minority. The opposite of this is to force everyone to be the same, and this is called totalitarian regime. So if you're not the hegemony, someone else will be the hegemony. And if you're trying to be inclusive, you end up doing cultural appropriation. Yoshua thinking of himself as an Arab is ridiculous in, in, in eyes of Arabs. Yeah? So um, should there therefore not be supportive attitude toward the Palestinians, Palestinian cause? Of course he should be. Of course Yoshua should be and think of himself as an Arab if he wants or whatever. Yeah? There's, um, yeah, stopping him is not going to solve anything. All that can be acknowledged is that the situation is complicated and actually if given enough time it can heal. Unfortunately time is the only thing that is not given. As the Israeli society is moving toward a, a se separatistic attitude, not non-inclusive one, um, both sides are being less ready for a dialogue and even people who tried in the past such as Masalha Shamas, Kashua, others um, have actually given up at this stage. There are new voices uh, of cooperation and new um, uh, actors on the scene, um, but this uh, is a topic for another lecture. Thank you very much for listening. It is now time for your assignments. Your assignment this week, think and write shortly your conclusions about the following question. Should a minority group be allowed to keep its own culture, a minority group such as an ethnic group which is uh, relocated to another country? So should such a group be allowed to keep its own culture? It is a big question, but try to think of points that should be taken into consideration. Submit your answer of around 200 words in the assignment link below. The date is also indicated below. And uh, thank you very much. And I will see you in the seminar. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah, yeah.